Good afternoon. Welcome to this virtual panel discussion on veteran entrepreneurship and post-traumatic stress, or PTS. I'm Karen Lloyd, the director of the Veterans History Project and a retired Army aviator. Too often, veterans managing PTS are depicted as fundamentally broken and unable to participate in society. While this may be true for some with extremely severe cases, the vast majority of veterans dealing with PTS live normal, fulfilling lives, a bit with a few extra challenges. A PTS diagnosis is not a terminal diagnosis to your hopes and dreams. And today we're going to explore how veterans can and have managed PTS symptoms while pursuing one of the most American dreams of all, starting and running your own business. As anyone who works for themselves knows, entrepreneurship is not easy, but you don't have to go it alone. Our panel includes veteran business owners who can describe their own path to success, as well as professionals from both inside and outside the government who can explain what services and assistance are available for veterans making that leap to self-employment and how these organizations have helped veterans make their dream a reality. Before we hear from them, there is something very important to note. A diagnosis of PTS is privileged medical information. And while the panelists may choose to share that information voluntarily, our participants were chosen for their knowledge of entrepreneurship and the subject matter of PTS, not because of any diagnosis they may or may not have. Their appearance on this panel in no way implies a PTS diagnosis. Well, with that important detail out of the way, my next, next task gives me great pleasure. I'd like to introduce and hand over the virtual microphone to our moderator and my friend, Chaz Henry. Chaz is a Marine Corps combat veteran, as well as the author and award-winning journalist with an on-air career spanning decades. He is deeply passionate about veterans' issues and has spent years bringing these issues into the public eye, most recently as producer and host of CBS News radio program, Eye on Veterans. You can hear some of Chaz reporting at his website, chazhenry.com. I can think of no one more qualified or better suited to lead this discussion. So with that, I'll turn, turn it over to you, Chaz. Thank you, Karen. As always, it's a privilege to be associated with the Veterans History Project, which does an extraordinary job of uh, documenting the lives and service experiences of uh, those who have served the nation in uniform. And uh, this being just another example of uh, the Veterans History Project continuing uh, in that important work. Today, we're talking about owning your own business while managing PTS. Either one of those uh, situations uh, is, uh, can be confounding or uh, seemingly insurmountable in and of itself. How do you do both successfully to thrive in life and business as a military veteran uh, doing, as Karen said, pursuing the American dream of owning your own business? It'll be a 90 minute conversation today on that topic. The first hour will involve our panelists uh, talking amongst themselves. I'll ask a few questions. They'll be sharing their life experiences and uh, advice uh, related to business ownership and dealing with stress that may have uh, come from a military experience. And then in the last half hour, we'll be taking your questions. So as you listen to today's conversation, if uh, questions come up, you hear something that's not addressed or you'd like to know more about, uh, either from the panel at large or from a particular individual, use the Q&A function button on uh, the WebEx environment. This is important, not chat, not chat, but the Q&A button and uh, send your question. In the last half hour, we'll try to get to some of those questions if we haven't already uh, uh, touched on those topics that are of particular interest to you. We really appreciate your joining and, and being part of this conversation. Hope that it will be useful. And a reminder again that this is not prescriptive, uh, the advice that's going to be offered today uh, as uh, either medical or uh, legal or uh, business advice, but we hope that it'll spark ideas that perhaps you can research further in other venues and perhaps apply in uh, your particular uh, endeavor, be it uh, dealing with one or the other of the situations or both, hopefully uh, adding more veterans to the uh, business owners uh, of America. So we're fortunate to have with us today an extraordinary panel of people whose life experiences um, involve their own military service in some cases, uh, business ownership, helping others uh, deal with post-traumatic stress and or uh, setting up businesses. There's going to be a lot of sort of a fountain of knowledge that we're going to be able to uh, offer you. 
And so let's uh, meet the panelists right now. We have Matthew Pavlik joining us, president and CEO of the National Veteran Owned Business Association. Before he uh, took on that CEO role, he was executive editor of Vetrepreneur Magazine. Uh, Matt, uh, Matthew will be bringing us a lot of information about uh, uh, business ownership and how veterans can ease into that uh, arena. Sarah Lizate joins us, an Army veteran whose military and post-military service experience led her to found, co-found Badges United. This is an organization that helps fund mental health care for law enforcers who would deal with a, a good a number of the same sort of uh, uh, situations, uh, having dealt with similar crises as people in the military uniform. So a lot of that information will be uh, useful across the board. From the New York City Department of uh, Veterans Services, we have Cassandra Alvarez and Greg Williams. Uh, they'll be able to offer us a lot of information about publicly available, and I'm sure they're aware of privately available programs uh, that could be useful to veterans in this situation. And then we have the co-owners of The Vet Chef, Amanda Gorley and Marine Corps veteran Kyle Gorley, uh, actually in the midst of things, in the trenches of business ownership, to offer their uh, experiences and advice. So let's begin by asking each of the panelists to offer perhaps uh, five minutes, um, uh, explaining sort of how you got to this particular point uh, through through military service, through working with veterans, through being involved in businesses, and um, and what particularly you think that that you will be able to add to this conversation based on on your experiences. So uh, let's keep these again to five or six minutes. And uh, why don't we? Start? Amanda, um, <laughs> we own the vet shop, like Chaz said, um, and we came into this actually um, in 2015. We opened our business. Um, and that was after Kyle had um, graduated and attended the Art Institute of Seattle uh, Culinary Management Program, um, where he actually teamed up with the um, Veterans Awareness Program for one of our local community colleges and spoke on a panel um, about how to reintegrate veterans, uh, specifically combat veterans, back into the civilian workforce. Um, through our conversations, we realized that there was a pretty significant um, issue with the civilian sector employers not being able to fully understand the psychological impact that combat has when reintegrating back into the civilian workforce. Um, and so Kyle came and said, what are we going to do about this? There's a serious problem that we need to address. Um, how, how, can we, how can we do this? And so our business was born. And I'll let Kyle kind of talk about some of our interactions with veterans that we've hired. Like Amanda said, we started off with a, a very small business, a food truck. We were um, starting with the understanding that we wanted to maybe branch off so other veterans could own a food truck at some time because um, the startup is just so small and it's kind of perfect for a veteran given the fact that uh, art is so successful integrating back into society. So we had the idea that, you know, we could start out with a food truck and um, at some point grow big enough where we can start um, putting putting food trucks in the other veterans hands so interesting so uh let me just ask briefly kyle in a photo i saw of you in the marine corps you're holding an artil artillery shell not a whisk so what yeah. was that path like to uh culinary art oh man how do you get there let's see <laughs> uh so yeah, I served in Ramadi, Iraq. I was a machine gunner. That was a IED we found along the side of the road. Um, there were six or seven of them daisy chained together, kind of a, not a normal day, but uh, in Ramadi, it wasn't, um, it wasn't that uncommon to find some pretty large IEDs. Uh, but honestly, I got out of school and knew I had this wonderful GI Bill waiting for me. And I knew, what? Oh yeah, got out of the military and uh, knew I had that wonderful GI Bill waiting for me. And I knew that I didn't really want to go to college. Um, last four years, I've been told what to do by the military. I kind of wanted to figure out what I want to do. So I wanted to culinary school and because I knew I, I, I really enjoyed it. So I was just thinking, why not get something that uh, I could use the rest of my life? I'm not necessarily wanting to start a restaurant or anything like that. And I started doing all these panels with, um, the uh, uh, college, uh, our local college, and speaking to people trying to hire veterans and understanding their struggles with questions like, hey, um, are you good at this? And a veteran looking them straight in the face and saying, no, not really. And 
them not really knowing what to do with that because um, they're not really used to hearing truths. Um, and I just kind of, one thing led to another through culinary school. I was like, man, this could be, this could be something we could stick some food trucks in other veterans' hands and watch uh, the success grow because it, I mean, we really think that it will grow. And for, for a uh, small business, it's, it's insane the the small startup cost for that so well a lot more to follow up on there and we will a little bit later but let's uh move to sarah sarah talk about your military experience if you would and uh and then your your interest in helping other veterans who have dealt with post-traumatic stress hi uh i'm sarah lazake uh, thank you for having me on today's panel um i'll just show a little bit of history on what led me to entrepreneurship in the first place um, I served in the Army for 10 years as military police. Uh, I first enlisted in the Army National Guard while I was in college uh, in order to have some experience when I applied for a job after graduation. Uh, a year later, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in criminology, and I became a full-time civilian police officer while also serving in the National Guard. Uh, as I started to work midnight shifts as a police officer in the inner city, I quickly realized that I had not received training on how to emotionally deal with the stressful situations that I was facing every night. Uh, after two years, I experienced a traumatic call and it became so hard for me to handle that I attempted suicide. The only thing that stopped me from pulling a trigger was the thought of maybe the pain will go away if I try to start a new life. And the very next day, I resigned from the police department and decided to go active duty in the Army. I had also decided that I wanted to become an officer, so I attended officer candidate school, commissioned as a military police officer, and started serving on active duty. Over the next several years, I experienced another traumatic event, but this time I tried my best to ignore the symptoms, push through it, and keep serving. I was able to manage this for a few years until I knew that I needed to get help. As soon as I made the call to behavioral health, I knew that it would ultimately end my Army career. I was formally diagnosed with PTSD and was fortunate enough to get treatment ranging from outpatient to intensive outpatient to inpatient to residential programs, plus a ton of complementary therapies. As I was starting to medically retire, I knew that I wanted to continue serving others. So two years ago, we started our nonprofit organization, Badges United Foundation. And our mission is to help first responders and their families with their mental and physical health. And one of our main programs is to provide financial assistance for first responders that are in mental health crisis in order to cover expensive health insurance deductibles. Therapy has had a huge impact on my life and I've become very passionate about it. And I've started my degree in clinical <coughs> work where uh, I'd like to specialize in working with first responders and veterans. Yeah, very briefly, you, you, uh, the couple of things that you mentioned to follow on quickly, uh, you mentioned that you've got sort of this wide spectrum of, of uh, care from the military. How would you characterize it? Was it useful? And Because I, I obviously you have seen where gaps are and are addressing that through this foundation. I'd be curious for your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. I was really fortunate to get all of this treatment while um, still in the military and going through a medical board. Um, and for, in my experience, going through um, all of the range of treatment that I, I received, um, it was it was life changing. It was life saving for me. And and that's really what I became so you know passionate about because I saw how uh, much of a difference it made. And um, I am incredibly thankful uh, to have received that treatment, um, you know, free of charge. Um, and and for first responders right now, um, you know, in the civilian world, they they still have very expensive health insurance deductibles, and so that's why I'm trying to limit, you know, anything that might steer them away from receiving, you know, um, mental health treatment if they are in crisis. Interesting. And again, we'll follow up and learn more. But let's move to Matthew Pavlik right now. And Matthew, uh, very business focused, uh, your endeavor, right? Absolutely. So, first of all, I'd like to thank all the veterans that are on the call, whether they're participants or whether they're listening in today. Thank you very much for your service. And uh, especially thank you to the Vietnam era veterans. I think a lot of folks from the newer generations enjoy a different experience 
And so thank you all for that. And thank you to everybody that's in charge of organizing this event and having us here. I'm very grateful to be given the opportunity to talk about what it is that we do and how we can continue to help veterans achieve that American dream that you were talking about earlier, Karen. So um, I'm an Army veteran myself. I joined right after high school and my, I was, my best friend and I uh, enlisted together. He enlisted in the Marine Corps and I enlisted in the Army. And we had very different uh, experiences. He ended up serving um, three different tours overseas, two in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. And, um, but I was able to, um, I, my service completed before 9-11 happened. It was a very different time. And his experience was so radically different than mine, but it gave me a very unique experience, uh, perspective because he also did suffer from um, PTSD and went through numerous treatments and things after his service was over. And he had some struggles uh, tragically on um, his two different deployments. Both of his parents passed away at different times. And there was a lot of things that really made it even that much more difficult for him. But um, so after my service, I went to work for a company called um, GI Jobs Magazine. I ended up being an assistant editor with that publication. And we were writing stories about um, job opportunities for veterans when they complete their military service. And we were yeah, interviewing veteran after veteran after veteran that are working in these career fields where there's a huge demand to hire veteran employees for a whole bunch of different reasons that they make excellent employees. If you're good at doing your job in the military, you tend to turn out to be a very good civilian employee as well. <clears throat> and so uh, we were telling these stories and I eventually got a chance to become the editor of Veteranpreneur Magazine, which is focused on veterans entrepreneurship. And so no matter who your customers are, there's an advantage to letting your customers know that your business is veteran owned because we did research that found 95% of uh, American consumers feel gratitude to the men and women who've served in the military and two thirds of respondents on our national survey said that they'd be more inclined to purchase from a business that's identified as veteran owned. So we're very grateful to see that there's a demand for that. And that was one of the things that we were able to achieve with that publication is letting uh, vets know how to leverage your veteran status to you know, lead to increased sales and greater business success. Um, but over time, I was, we were telling these stories about veterans and this was in um, 2012 and there was, a lot of things that were happening with veterans um, employment, people trying to um, find ways to help because there was a significant employment issue with post 9-11 veterans, especially the younger generation of vets between the you know 19 to 23 year old vets and they were having a difficult time finding jobs. And we were writing these stories of these successful veterans, many of whom had overcome PTSD and were still successful employees and dependable and drug free the type of leaders that people want to have that they can rely on to work in, in all kinds of career fields, whether it's the transportation industry and the security and corrections industry, law enforcement, a bunch of different places that um, folks really worked out well. And so um, I decided to go to um, University of Kentucky to work on my PhD program there. And what I was looking at, I was, I kind of had uh, experience with a lot of veterans and understood that the overwhelming majority of veterans, even those folks that um, were injured or were suffering PTSD were better off as a result of the service that they had given to our country and were able to take that expensive training and the experience that they had to be given opportunities at leadership and things at a very young age for many of them. And that translated well to successful attributes and things that could um, manifest as positive things for their post-military careers. But we weren't really seeing that in what I coined as legacy media. The, the narrative that was being told was the um, the broken hero or the, the damaged goods. And if you, and so the University of Kentucky has a program that allows you to do high level content analyses of millions of artifacts of media coverage. And I was able to, uh, to, to validate statistically what I kind of knew anecdotally that when our media is telling a story about veterans, it's not giving an accurate depiction of the, the, the experience for the majority of folks. And so um, that's what we were trying to continue to do with that. And that's what we try to do with Navova. And so when we launched Navova, we understand that there's a huge opportunity for veteran owned businesses in all kinds of sectors. If a veteran is familiar with the term veteran owned business, it's almost a guarantee that they're trying to get government work. Um, although that has changed over time, but that definitely was the case back in 2007 and, and 2012. So the, Folks may be aware that there's a federal government requirement for the for 3% of federal contract dollars to go to service disabled, better known small businesses. 
And so 3% of what the government outsources annually is about $15 billion. And that's a, that's a significant opportunity that's there for veterans. But uh, very few vets are aware of what's happening in the private sector. And so Fortune 500 companies, there are way many more of them, and they spend an awful lot more money on the whole than uh, the federal government or state governments do. And so um, we've been advocating to make sure that veterans have an equal seat at the table in these corporate supplier diversity programs. And so that has, we started that, you know, there was 2007, there was a thousand, I'm sorry, a hundred companies on the Fortune 1000 list. Now on the Fortune 500 alone, we see that's gone up to about 438 of the Fortune 500 have included veterans as part of their supplier diversity efforts. So it's been very successful and we're very grateful to see that. And some of the things that are really positive for me is when we see these successful entrepreneurs and some of them who have overcome incredible difficulties so we have our veteran business enterprise of the year awards and so the last year's recipient is a marine corps veteran uh, double amputee uh, with both lower legs um, overcame ptsd is incredibly successful as a business owner and we have a, a lot of examples of folks that have overcome a great deal and they found that business ownership is something that helps them that same level of camaraderie and other people relying on you for something very important they've seen that in a, in running a business so knowing that folks are counting on you and this business to be successful to feed their families is a, a, a level of stress that's actually a very good positive stress for some of these folks when they are successful at entrepreneurship so anything that we can do to help the veteran community succeed in entrepreneurship i think is in, is very beneficial in many ways plus Veteran-owned companies statistically hire about 30% more veteran-owned employees than non-veteran-owned companies. So everything we can do to elevate entrepreneurship for veterans is positive for the entire veterans community. To that last point, we've already seen the example with Kyle and Amanda and uh, mm -hmm. their business model. You've raised a lot of interesting points uh, that I want to come back to, to include uh, how veterans see themselves uh, when it comes to the possibility of being an entrepreneur and how others outside see veterans. Because I think vet people often think of people in the military as uh, uh, people who follow orders well, but uh, are not necessarily individually decisive. So that'll uh, be something worth our following up on. Let's uh, head to Cassandra Alvarez from the New York City uh, Department of Veterans Services. And uh, we'll talk to you briefly and then to Greg, since you all are working from home in different uh, locations. Um, Talk a little bit, uh, if you would, Cassandra, about uh, your association with these two different issues. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Chaz and Andrew Huber and the great folks at the Library of Congress for having Greg and I be a part of today's discussion. Very grateful to you. And I want to take a moment to also thank all of the veterans on the line for your service. Um, we're very much grateful to all that you've given to our country and what you continue to give. Um, so, again, we're so pleased to be here. Um, I am the Associate Commissioner of Public-Private Partnerships with the New York City Department of Veterans Services. Um, I, myself, am actually a civilian. I am the granddaughter of a Korean War veteran who is still alive and very well at 91 years old, uh, very much a father figure to me. Um, and our agency uh, was established in 2016, uh, and it's the first municipal level agency in the country dedicated to serving veterans and their families. Uh, and we offer a wide range of services uh, from helping veterans obtain their uh, VA benefits to hosting um, convenings and events and community discussions that help veterans network with one another, uh, learn about resources, and ultimately help them achieve a higher level of success and well-being. Um, our commissioner is Colonel James Hendon. He is actually a veteran entrepreneur himself as a former veteran business owner. So this topic is very passionate to him and it's definitely ingrained in the ethos of our agency. Uh, there's no question that New York City sees the incredible value that veterans bring to our city. And um, uh, Something that, that was referenced earlier is that veterans make amazing business owners, amazing employees. We know that they're more civically engaged than their civilian counterparts. So there are so many reasons why the city has invested in uh, fostering wonderful communities for veterans to thrive here in New York City and helping bring networks to the forefront that help veterans again achieve that next level of well-being. Uh, Self-care and wellness is also ingrained in the mission of our agency and certainly throughout the broader New York City government as well. 
there's a program called Thrive NYC that really opens up the conversation about uh, self-care and mental wellness. And that certainly translates to everything that we do in New York City as well. Um, so I'll pause right there and uh, let Greg introduce himself uh, as my fantastic colleague. Hello, can everybody hear me? Testing one, two, good. Okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, Spectrum is working on my wireless service now. So if any time I get cut <laughs> off, I blame them. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Gregory Williams. I am a U.S. Army combat veteran. I actually still serve in reserve. So don't let the COVID hair fool you. <laughs> okay. Yes, this is not AR 670-1 uh, appropriate, but Hey, my command sergeant major, she let me get away with it for now. Uh, currently, I still serve with the 361st uh, Theater Public Affairs Support Element out of Fort Tot in New York. And I do work with Cassandra at the New York City Department of Veteran Services. A little brief history about myself. I used to work at Fox News and I left, you know, a nice little chunk of change to actually work with our veteran population. Uh, it called to me as far as probably 2014, 2015, when I started working with Vietnam era vets at a local veteran residence. And a lot of them, you know, it was PTSD, seclusion, isolation. And I said, you know, I need to step up. I need to do more. And right now I feel, you know, the newer generation, the Afghanistan war, the Iraqi war veterans, you know, we have to do our due diligence to take care of those that came before us. So, you know, I left my job and I left and work now at DVS. I'm a manager of strategic partnerships. And currently I manage our oral history initiative, which is called the Veteran Voices Project. Uh, one of my MOSs, I have three MOSs, military occupational specialties. I have transportation, civil affairs, and public affairs. One of them being public affairs. I tell the army story. So why not bring that over to DVS and tell the veteran story? Um, much like the Library of Congress uh, History Project, you know, I go more into the cultural diversity that resides within New York City. I always tell people no veteran is the same. Each story is different. We go by era, by age, by race, by upbringing. Uh, I interviewed a World War II vet one week, and then the next week I was talking to one of the guys who toppled Saddam Hussein Palace. And what do you do when you have $100 million and you're a soldier and you're sitting on top of all this money? Everybody saw Three Kings. It really didn't go down like that. Uh, <laughs> so I have the blessing of being able to talk to veterans, um, take down their oral history, and like Cassandra, you know, go out there into the community and educate our local veteran population on all the benefits that are afforded to them. Myself, you know, I have no shame. I suffer from PTSD. I'm service connected. Even before I joined this panel, I was on the phone with my virtual appointment at the vet center, you know, getting treatment. So this is an ongoing battle for myself and I try my hardest to deal with it every day, but there's no shame in talking about it. There's no shame in having it. And you just have to take it one step at a time. As far as entrepreneurial, I myself had my own business. I failed miserably. It's okay to fail. <laughs> and you just have to, like the song says, know when to fold them. And you have to pretty much educate yourself and seek education to become a successful entrepreneur. You know, I didn't know anything about a business plan and now I'm learning about that. So uh, yeah, I can speak on both topics. I live both topics and, you know, it's just a life of service for me. And that's all I have at this point. Great, well, thank you, Greg. So obviously a huge spectrum of experience, uh, life experience and uh, good and bad experiences that the, we can share with the veterans who are on this call when it comes to the uh, subject of uh, owning a business and dealing with post-traumatic stress. Uh, remember the first part of the conversation uh, will deal amongst the panelists, but if you have questions, you're out there uh, and something's not addressed, use the Q&A function and uh, send us a note. We'll try to get to those in the last half hour of this 90 minute program. Um, I, was, I had another uh, question about gathering capital, which is important, uh, in a, uh, particularly if you're not uh, sitting on the three kings uh, cash in a Saddam Hussein castle. 
uh, veterans are all, uh, like all others, trying to start a business need to get capital. But something that uh, uh, Matthew said earlier sparked me to think about, do veterans make good business owners? And if so, why? Particularly a veteran who may have dealt with the traumatic uh, situation in the past. Sarah, do you have a thought on that to start with? I mean, as far as startup capital, um, I am a nonprofit, 501c3, and um, a lot of the startup capital uh, came from my co-founder and I's um, own pockets, um, but we were able to um, use that towards doing some fundraising, and we have, we've been uh, fortunate enough to, to have gotten quite a bit of funding from the Gary Sinise Foundation, and that's really, that's how we started out in our first year and we're still continuing to go that way. Um, but I think it's a little bit different as a nonprofit. We mostly um, depend on, you know, um, donors and grants. Right, and, and you're personally associated with that topic. So as you're speaking to potential donors, you have that going for you as well. What do you think it is about you as a veteran though that uh, helps you operate your endeavor in a way perhaps that a non-veteran uh, wouldn't be approaching it? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I, I definitely am, am not, um, I'm definitely a lot more able to talk about my experience and share my story. And that really is what captivates uh, the investors, you know, and, and having that like cultural competence of, hey, these are the people that I'm trying to raise money for. I do have the experience um, and this is why I wanna help them. And really being able to have that storytelling aspect um, has, has really helped out a lot. Um, but, you know, sort of that take charge and um, self-discipline is something that I really relied on um, that was something that I developed while I was in the military. Kyle and Amanda, how about you? Now, you, you've dealt with starting your own business and then you're talking about perhaps helping other veterans do the same. What do you think you brought to it? Uh, and, and what are you looking for in the veterans you're thinking of incorporating into this larger enterprise? So one thing you're going to hear me say a lot is uh, the low startup cost, because I think that that is so important. When I was looking at some of the other ideas uh, to starting your business, I was just blown away at some of the uh, startup costs. So um, we got into our business for under $50,000. Um, so we basically were fortunate enough to get a, a loan from a, a, a family member. So we we just honestly got lucky there but i can say that um during this whole <laughs> weird world we live right now the COVID era um we've got grants from amazon um from um just strictly for being a veteran uh company so i know that people are always just willing to help and wanting to help veterans and we feel very fortunate for that obviously yeah, and I think kind of what Matt was speaking to about um, funding and veterans being able to get access to those loans. Uh, there's a lot of research that indicates that post 9-11 veterans are not actually entering um, entrepreneurship um, as much as their World War II or even South Korean counterparts. I think it was... Um, World War II veterans, 49.7% of World War II veterans came back home and after service started their own business for South Korea or Korea War. It was 40%, um, only 4.5% of post 9-11 veterans have started their own businesses. And what Matt was speaking to about, you know, the amount of veteran owned businesses supplying jobs for other veterans, um, that's a huge decrease in the amount of opportunities of employment for veterans. And so one of the things that Kyle and I discovered throughout this process of business ownership and um, growing our business is that there, there is a very, I guess, lesser opportunity for veteran owned businesses and funding um, specifically for civilian sector banks. Um, even SBA is challenging, um, you know, loans compared to those eras for veterans are significantly higher in the amount of interest rate that is being charged and borrowing is much harder nowadays than it was back then um you know you have to have typically two years of business establishment in order to get these higher um loan amounts and so there's a lot more obstacles when it comes to funding um for anybody, but specifically veterans that are trying to get into, into entrepreneurship. 
Matthew, what have you found? Uh, and I, I'd be curious to your thoughts on on our veterans, and particularly as uh, Amanda raises, particularly uh, say post 9/11 veterans, well suited for business ownership. That's an interesting question, and I think it's a case by case thing. But I think generally speaking, I think all veterans, when they the things that you learn in the military, like leadership and discipline, and those things, tend to make you successful as an entrepreneur because a lot of business owners will say, well, I want to start a business so I can make my own hours, but they don't realize they're going to work 90 hours a week, right? So, um, and I think a lot of the things that you do in the military community that you just take for granted are incredibly valuable assets in entrepreneurship in the civilian sector. But generally speaking, veterans are 45% more likely to start businesses than non-military folks. And uh, one out of seven veterans are, uh, own a business compared to one out of 14 non-vets of working age Americans, and there's a bunch of theories on why that is. Um, uh, the overrepresentation, I don't think it's a huge surprise because the, the things that we learn, teamwork, ingenuity, integrity, resolve, all those things, they're the most important ingredients for success for starting a business. One of the phenomenon that, that I've found is there are a lot of business owners that are, um, a lot of veteran business owners that don't let folks know that they're a veteran owned business. And there's a, a couple different reasons for that, I think. First and foremost, they don't understand that they're a veteran-owned business. They just served in the Marine Corps for a few years, and now they run a business, and they don't kind of understand how that actually is a veteran-owned business. And for a lot of those folks, especially for veterans that um, don't have a service-connected disability, they feel like if they do that, they're somehow taking away something from another veteran that has paid a more significant price, and these programs are more for them and not necessarily for, for that business owner. And something that isn't unique or exclusive to the veteran business community, but I do believe that it's overrepresented, is this idea that they view listing their diversity status as somehow um, remedial. Like this is, they don't need that. They have an excellent idea, they have an excellent team of people, they provide excellent value to their customers, and they don't necessarily need this program. These are for folks that and so when you have really successful veteran business owners that are doing the great work, and this is not just veterans. I mean, there's a lot of minority business owners and women business owners that I've met over the years because this diversity business world, it, it, there's so much um, intersectionality between all these different communities and so many folks that are veterans who are also women, who are also veterans, who are also LGBT, and et cetera, which is why we have all these award programs recognizing these folks. But for a lot of these successful business owners, they are... You, their customers almost have to say, hey, you're a diverse company, please let us know this. We want to be able to measure the spending that we're doing with you. And I do think that that seems to be, and I don't have any data to validate this, this is just anecdotally speaking, but it seems to be more prevalent in the veteran community that vets don't necessarily want to win business because they're vets, they want to win business because they're excellent at what they do. And when they understand that this is something that's important to their customers, I think that it helps. And um, some research is being conducted right now through the Institute for Vets and Military Families in partnership with the uh, Kauffman Foundation, and they're looking at some of the trends about veteran business ownership and what is the best way to provide uh, resources, what resources work, and things like that. And so some of the, when Amanda brought up the idea that a lot of the post-9-11 generation vets are not starting business at the same rates, um, um, that's an interesting data point. And I don't know if it's because the the difficulty accessing capital, which certainly is true. I mean, it, it's really difficult for any business owner to get capital, um, especially after the 2008 financial crisis, banks became exceptionally risk averse. But um, at the same time, with all the efforts that were there to help vets get jobs, um, there could be some explanation about this. It's a path of least resistance. So I know that my dad wanted to start a business a long time ago when he was younger, but um, he was getting pressured to get a job because it had benefits and take care of the kids and stuff like that. So he never did it and regretted it. So if you have an option to get a, a good paying job and it's not an easy thing to start a business as any of these entrepreneurs can tell you. So maybe there could be some explanation with that, but that research is ongoing. I'm looking forward to, to what we find with that because we definitely want to see younger generations of veterans that are coming out, have an opportunity to start businesses and be successful. And, and one really fascinating thing that we're working on right now is there's so many Vietnam era veterans that are successful business owners that want to retire and they want their businesses to stay veteran owned. And so many business owners that want to, or um, veterans that are transitioning out now that are thinking about starting a business, it'd be much more beneficial for them to 
partner up with an existing better known company as sort of like a mentor protege slash succession planning program where they can work with them and then sell the business to somebody else. So and, and instead of starting from scratch and competing with somebody to actually have a mentor relationship where you get the business that you get handed the keys to. And so there, we're working on a pilot program with that we're gonna do this summer and hopefully over the next couple of years, we're gonna be able to get some veterans that don't have to start from scratch and they can actually hit the ground running with a, an established business that other folks can then step away from. It also hires a lot more veterans as employees and everything else. So there's a lot of opportunity that's out there, but definitely rife with challenge for sure. And that sounds like an interesting opportunity to create this uh, you know, match.com for these uh, existing successful business owners interested in perhaps uh, turning over the business. Uh, Cassandra, to the issue of uh, capital, uh, we, we've all you know, intuitively know, and then we've heard some particular examples that it's difficult to get startup capital for a business. Um, what if you're a veteran, you're just a veteran going into to a bank or some other lender trying to find the, the, uh, uh, that money to start up, you have this great idea, but you've also dealt with the post-traumatic stress. Whether you share that information or not with the lending officer, there's a chance that this lending officer who's probably never served in the military, maybe never known anyone who served, is going to have that in the back of that mind as they do a risk assessment. What has uh, what has your office found with regard to this, and have there been ways to get around or overcome? Yeah, thanks so much for the question, Chaz. Um, so, you know, we know that there's about 2.5 million veteran-owned businesses that make up 9% of all U.S. businesses in the country, right? And so that means that their annual revenue is about $1 trillion. Um, and so we also know that there are so many great barriers, and it's been mentioned time and time again during this conversation already, to accessing social, financial, and intellectual capital. Um, and COVID-19 has certainly thrown a curveball our way as well. But I, our what we see and what we recommend is before a veteran business owner even enters that bank, before they even try to find that capital, um, we want them to fully embrace the fact that knowledge is power. There are so many resources out there, and we urge all veteran-owned businesses to become familiar with what national and local programs they have access to. Um, there's great private sector resources that can help empower veteran business owners to understand the proper pathway for themselves and the right people to talk to and even the right financial institutions to go to. Um, and the ones that come to mind, actually Matthew referenced earlier, uh, the Syracuse Institute for uh, Veteran and Military Families, they are one of the premier institutions in this space and they're a great partner to our agency as well. Uh, and they run the Coalition for Veteran-Owned Businesses. Um, and that puts together regional forums uh, that help veterans be veteran owned businesses become procurement ready. Uh, they're also tethered to a network of financial institutions and companies that have contract set asides to work specifically with veteran owned businesses. Um, and their network includes brands like Walmart, Pfizer, Johnson and Johnson, Barclays. Um, and so, you know, accessing things like that, programs like that helping understand the full gamut of what you are about to walk into and the right places to go to, to work with institutions that are already veteran friendly are the proper path to go on in order to meet greater success. Let's, uh, you know, all the panelists, I'll ask you if, uh, uh, Cassandra mentioned the Institute for Veterans and Military Families, IVMF, uh, which is based out of Syracuse University. Uh, as we think of these, let's offer them to people who are listening in so people can take notes. And uh, I think a lot of benefit in addition to our conversation will come from these places for more information. So IVMF uh, at uh, Syracuse University is a great place to search. So um, uh, Sarah, uh, operating an enterprise of the sort that, uh, that you do, a million details involved, um, and there is an enjoyable, rewarding part of the business, but uh, with any business, there are a lot of, or enterprise, a nonprofit in your case, there are a lot of things that have to be done, be they, uh, you know, record keeping, filing, tax uh, preparation, tax documents. Um, that is stressful. And uh, a person who has been through a stressful uh, set of circumstances in the military or in a law enforcement setting, how do you keep that from compounding so that you can still be successful in doing these things you don't do so that you can do the things that you like to do uh, and not sparking and uh, building a bigger fire under pre-existing uh, stress conditions. 
Well, let me tell you, it is absolutely stressful and time consuming um, to run a business. Um, but, you know, I like to try to be aware of some of the things that overlap of the characteristics of being an entrepreneur as well as having PTS. And I think that I'm just, you know, aware that being an entrepreneur means you mostly have to, you know, social network and sometimes that can be, you know, within large crowds and that can trigger, uh, you know, anxiety and hypervigilance uh, and, and av avoidance altogether. Um, and, and another one is, is being a self starter and, and, you know, being motivated, um, is a characteristic of being an entrepreneur and, you know, that can really be affected if you have depression, um, you know, really presenting that day or, or whatnot. And then you also need to have the energy to be sometimes a one person show. And I think that that could be difficult if you, uh, you know, get a lack of sleep because you're having nightmares, which is, you know, characteristic of PTS. And there's a lot of the times that you really need to know, you know, all the details of your business plan, your operations, staff, clients, experiences, and that can be difficult when you have, you know, memory loss or lack of concentration, which are all, again, characteristics of PTSD. And so I think that these symptoms can be difficult and inconvenient. Uh, and that's why it's incredibly important to have self-awareness and recognize that, you know, some of these symptoms, if not all, are happening to you and to practice self-care and to rely on healthy coping skills. And, and one of the most important things for me is to have built a community of, you know, other veteran entrepreneurs that do suffer from PTS um, so that we can, you know, rely on them when we're having these symptoms and, you know, they can provide a really strong social support system. Are there any other workarounds or, uh, it's too glib to say tricks, but are, are there things that you find yourself doing that help you uh, deal, say, with the memory issue or other aspects of this? Yes, I rely heavily on my co-founder um, to, you know, write down a lot of experiences um, and I bounce a lot of ideas off her. So I'm really glad that I'm not completely alone. Um, but, you know, I, like I said, I practice self-care so much, especially now during the COVID era. I mean, that is 100%, you know, I absolutely have to mandatory put everything else above, um, you know, entrepreneurship or anything is, you know, my mental health and knowing that I am at risk of, you know, experiencing some, if not all of these symptoms. And then that just rendering me completely disabled from being able to do my mission in the first place. So self-care, 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 reaching out for support. Uh, and for me, therapy works really well and I'm a huge advocate for it. Great. Uh, Amanda and Kyle, um, so we've talked about these things that are involved with running a, a business. Uh, there are a lot of people involved. So you have each other, you have vendors, you have customers who are always right, right? Uh, yeah. You have uh, your employees uh, or other people that you're looking to bring into the business. Um, so Kyle and Amanda, how do you deal with the, uh, uh, if dealing with other stresses, those things pile on top of it, uh, what advice do you have for a, a military veteran who might be in that situation to get through successfully? Yeah, so I mean, I think there's a number of things. Um, we're very fortunate in the fact that, um, you know, Kyle actually did get her overseas. And so we play off of each other's strengths and weaknesses where he might suffer um, from the increased stress of the job and um, memory issues, concentration issues. I can pick up in those areas. We also have a staff um, that does have veterans on it. And part of our mission is to have um, veterans and their family members um, as staff, um, not just into branching into giving them their own business, but also teaching them through community outreach programs, um, you know, how to be involved, how to kind of what Sarah was talking about. Um, you know, we believe that doing community work and um, charity work takes the focus off of the self and puts it onto the onto something else, something bigger. Um, and by doing that, we have seen a significant turnaround in some of the behavioral um, challenges that some of our veteran staff have, and including their family members. Um, you know, Kyle is really great at obviously coming from the veteran approach, understanding our veteran staff, 
understanding some of our veteran vendors that we work with, um, while I come from more of the civilian sector. And so we really try and utilize both sides to meet those challenges head on. So yin and yang proves yeah. very useful in, <laughs> in that circumstance. Are, are there, uh, so thinking about people who are uh, listening in on this conversation, are there resources that have been really helpful to you that uh, the people might want to jot down as they're listening to us? So I think for us, um, honestly, the VA has some amazing programs um, and business counseling services that they can direct you. We were directed to some of our local um, credit unions to discuss you know, business parameters as far as banking goes. Um, we have been very fortunate enough to receive a lot of feedback and help from local media as well as national media. Um, so there isn't really any one particular that I would say, but understanding that those resources do exist um, we started with our local VA and um, Kyle's outreach team was able to point us in the direction um, for business growth and um, entrepreneurship and that kind of opened everything up for us. Great. Okay. Uh, you know, Matthew, I'm thinking that, uh, that you've got a lot of uh, bullet points to offer. Let's start off with um, a few, and I'm guessing that your organization is, is one of them. If uh, people listening in our conversation today want to jot down places they can find information useful to, say, uh, finding out about uh, uh, not just the government set aside work for veterans, but private companies that do the same. And uh, what, what are the three or four best bullets that uh, you would offer? So for the government side, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center program is great because they are all over the country. The APTAC is the place to go, but it's the APTAC, and that's the organization that'll let you know where the most um, accessible location is for you. And that is specifically geared to help folks um, become a contracting firm that works with government agencies. So the Small Business Development Centers is another one, which is a, a network. It's an SBA funded resource. and that's really great for when you have a, a business idea that you want and they can help you with the whole planning structure to turn it into a successful enterprise as opposed to simply an idea on a napkin or something like that. The Service Corps of Retired Executives is another one that's an SBA funded program. You can work with some folks who can serve as a mentor for you. And then I, uh, it was mentioned before um, about the uh, Coalition for Better Known Businesses and the uh, Institute for Veterans and Military Families. So there's an awful lot of organizations that are out there. The overwhelming majority of them are no cost to the veteran business owner. And so if you're really looking to start a business or to grow a business, and uh, the final one that I would say is the uh, Veteran Business Outreach Center. There are not nearly as many of those, but um, we've worked closely with the directors of the various Veteran Business Outreach Center programs. Now those are kind of like the veteran, uh, the Small Business Development Center, but they're specifically focused for veteran clients only. So, and typically they have veterans that are there and they're part of those programs as well. So, um, and once again, all of their services they provide would be free for the veteran businesses to come in as clients. So we definitely would like to uh, make sure that people are aware of that. And of course, what we're doing with Naboba in the private sector, we'd love to work with any veteran business that wants to become a certified veterans business enterprise that's gonna work with uh, these large Fortune 500 companies and their supplier diversity programs. The core function of what we do is making sure that the businesses are owned, operated, and controlled by veterans. And very much like my mentor who used to direct the women's program tells me that every uh, guy who had an odd sister or a niece was a woman-owned business until they started to look. Unfortunately, there are some bad actors out there. And so a certification program to make sure that vets are who they say they are and actually run the company is something that's essential. And that's why the corporate partners that we have, we call them our corporate allies. That's why they were um, so willing to fund a program like this um, to make sure that we actually make sure that veterans are who they say they are and run their companies. Interesting. So certification, right. I think we've all known, those of us who have been around a while, someone who uh, roped a veteran in and, and said, okay, you're our president and we're going to pay you this and, and we're going to run this company and we're going to get the contract. Um, so obviously we really want that money to be going to help uh, particular veterans. Uh, do you have a sense that things are moving into a more legitimate uh, um, percentage of you know, actual veterans running these companies that are getting the government contracts? In the government world, I'm not certain. So one of the misconceptions that's out there is the, the veterans, um, the, the VA does have its Center for Verification and Evaluation at vetbiz.gov, and they do um, 
ensure ownership, operation, and control. But Public Law 108-183 requires the VA to buy from vets first. And there has been significant efforts to make sure that they're doing that. Uh, there was a Supreme Court case with the Kingdomware decision in recent years that uh, kind of enforced that rule of two where the VA has to do that. But what a lot of people don't understand is that verification program is only for VA and the Federal Aviation Administration are the only two federal agencies required to source out of that database and use that to measure their spending. Any other agency, if a veteran business is listed on SAM.gov and it's a SDVOSB, there's no other scrutiny um, prior to that. Now, there's a lot of after the fact where what you described the rent a vet scam, as we call it, where somebody who's um, family member or somebody served in the military, but they don't have anything to do with the company, they just own it on paper. Every I just read an article about it yesterday morning, and there's a lot of people that get caught when the Government Accountability Office does uh, an assessment after the fact. And so it, it still happens quite frequently because there isn't a federal government wide requirement for certification for veteran businesses. And I don't know if there will be. We're not necessarily in that business to do that, but there's something that our corporate partners aren't willing to run that risk. That's it's encouraging to hear that I wasn't even aware that there were these. Uh, formalized programs in the corporate sector that looked at veterans as part of a diverse community, be it as employees or vendors uh, from whom they purchase. So that's uh, very encouraging. I want to remind you that uh, if you are uh, listening right now and you have questions that we've not addressed, send us uh, through the Q&A function uh, on WebEx uh, a note. And uh, in a few moments, I'm expecting uh, that I will get an email from our producer, Andrew Huber, um, email me, please, Andrew, with, with uh, some of those questions, and we'll we'll get to those. Uh, let's put uh, Greg on the spot. Greg, if, if you're still with us, do you have, uh, you, you talk about telling the stories of, of these veterans that are uh, helped by the uh, Department of Veterans Services. Do you recall having spoken and told the story about a veteran who is dealing in this circumstance we're addressing today, uh, owning a business uh, and working to thrive even uh, after having dealt with some traumatic stress? So, coincidentally enough, <laughs> um, one of my most recent interviews was with uh, U.S. Army combat veteran Thomas Smote. And Thomas's story was very invigorating in that he also, like myself, uh, we're part of the Civil Affairs Military Occupational Specialty. And Thomas actually was deployed in Baghdad in 2003 and 2004. So right before the topple of like Saddam Hussein's re uh, regime. And Thomas himself went on these daily deployments. He worked with the British Army, something that a lot of, you know, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, we don't really always have that joint uh, task force component attached to us. But he actually was able to serve with the Spanish army, the Mongolians, the British. And he had this, this wealth of experience and being in combat and traveling throughout Iraq. And he came back and he talked about the troubles of transitioning, uh, the troubles of readjustment, um, you know, trying to keep one foot in the door within the military but then trying to find a job, you know? And where's Thomas today? Thomas owns his own, he owns his own company. Um, you know, he, he's one of those success stories where he went, he received treatment, he, you know, developed a plan. He now has a, 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 a company out here in New York City and um, he he's actually successfully made that transition to being an entrepreneur. It took a long time for him. You know, it took almost seven, eight years to, you know, get back on his feet and to kind of find that focus of what he actually wants to do. And one of the things when I talked with him, I said, well, Thomas, what pushed you, you know, to get to this point? And he said it was it was simply talking to other veterans and those veterans not not those veterans not um, being afforded the opportunity to share their experiences to share their stories you know more often times he talked to a lot of veterans who never who never um, they were afforded the opportunity to share their experience whether it was positive or negative so Every day, Thomas, you know, he talks to veterans, he employs veterans, he, you know, works in the veteran sphere, 
Um, I would love to promote his business, but unfortunately, you know, being a city agency, you can't like, bam, you know, <laughs> but I can share Thomas's, um, you know, he, he is pushed and he is reinvigorated every day by interacting with veterans and reaffirming that we care about one another and there are people out there that care about you. So that, Great. Encouraging. You know, yeah. And capturing his story, it, it was just really awesome to hear Iraq 2003, 2004, you know, soldiers not traveling with up armored Humvees going through, right. you know, Those were challenging years. Yeah. And yes, that's, that's it, you know. In encouraging. Those examples, anecdotes are always very encouraging. And it's, uh, and I'm sure there are probably more out there, <laughs> pardon me, than uh, about which we're aware. We've got some questions now that have come in, again, using the Q&A function on WebEx, so please continue to send these. Um, Emily, who's joining us, uh, writes, has anyone had experience leveraging resources via the Office of Veterans Business Development at the Small Business Administration, like the Veterans Business Outreach Centers or Boots to Business training programs? Um, so if any of our participants just uh, speak up, uh, if you have had personal experience or know someone perhaps who has worked with, uh, so the Office of Veterans Business Development at the SBA, um, and uh, their programs apparently include the Veteran Business Outreach Centers or Boots to Business. Be like I have personally worked with the um, Veteran Business Outreach Center out of uh, Maricosta. In California, Hazel Beck is the director. She's an Army veteran, and she also serves on Novova's board of directors and also works in on our certification committee and our marketing committee as well. And so um, she's been a very wonderful uh, resource to have on our team to help us understand specifically the type of questions and things that are coming in from veterans when they're seeking um, resources. And Novova used to be part of the um, the media company that we worked with, with publishing Veteran GI Jobs Magazine. And in 2017, we separated that to become its standalone nonprofit organization. And going through that process from actually from about 2016 uh, until um, it was 2017, November is when we finally got the IRS approval and everything to turn it into its, we're essentially a small business, we're just a nonprofit. And I did work with the Small Business Development Center to, um, to facilitate a lot of those changes and transition that we had to do to take something that used to be a for-profit media enterprise and turn it into a nonprofit organization with a uh, corporate governance structure and in, in the nonprofit sector. So it was very helpful. And I do know that I've talked to an awful lot of veterans over the years that have used uh, the Veteran Business Outreach Centers. <clears throat> and we've worked with the folks at the national level, the Office of uh, Veteran Business Development, just to make sure that we understand how to provide information to veterans that come to us, because we don't necessarily work in the space of helping veterans start businesses, but we know that there's an incredible um, array of resources that are out there. So knowing how these things all work and how to steer these folks in the right direction, and then hearing from them later when they were able to start these businesses and become successful has been really rewarding for us. So it has been a very positive experience. And we have uh, a lot of information that we can share about how to get people in those uh, or where they can find more information about these things if they come to us too, as well. So g give us the uh, URL, uh, because I imagine that, that, you, that you have a repository of a lot of additional points of contact there, right? Yeah, if you could just specifically go to novova.org, that's the easiest place. And then there's a contact us feature at the bottom of the web page. And so if they just want to ask for anything specifically, then we'll make sure that we steer them to the right direction. We have um, a series of different resource pages and resource partners, but if they send us a message, we'll have a member of our team reach out, find out exactly what they're looking for and kind of um, personalize the experience to make sure we get them steered in the proper direction. Because we don't do everything for every veteran, but there's no, there's no reason to do that. But we do know the ones that have been very helpful and where we can uh, point people to the things that they actually need. It's a long uh, acronym, so if you can spell that out, please, for the address. Yeah, it's www.n, as in November, Alpha, Victor, Oscar, Bravo, Alpha, dot org. So, novova, dot org. Great. I was waiting for, a, for somebody to get into the uh, phonetic alphabet there. It wouldn't be a military-related uh, uh, webinar if, if, if we didn't. Uh, we have a, another note from Eric uh, attending the uh, webinar. Thanking everyone for uh, your incredible knowledge, resources, and insight into uh, veterans with PTSD and business. Does anyone on the panel have more 
uh, insight into leveraging the vocational rehab chapter 31 self-employment program through the VA. Um, it says, uh, I'm, I'm in the program, but not uh, seeing any help. I, I wasn't aware of uh, voc rehab as, it, as regards entrepreneurship. So perhaps uh, if someone here uh, has dealt with that, they can fill us in. I know, Matthew, is that anything that, uh, that you are familiar with? I've talked to the veterans over the years that have used the program, and we have definitely have had, uh, if it was more for um, getting a job, more so than for um, starting a business, although some folks are in sole proprietorships and things like that where they're self-employed but not quite necessarily going to be an employer firm. And we have worked with um, other groups that have come to us in the past and said that they want to in propose legislation that would allow for folks to use their GI Bill funding to possibly, instead of, if they're not gonna go to college and they don't have a dependent to transfer the benefit to, it seems to be wasted money, could they use that for startup capital for a business? And there's a whole bunch of nuance that goes into that. But um, specifically about the vocational rehab program, we have not really, I don't have enough direct experience with it outside of interviewing some vets and writing stories about them that have used that for employment purposes. I haven't had an experience with entrepreneurship. Okay. Anyone else, uh, just so we make sure we exhaust uh, every possibility, Eric, I think we might be coming up dry on, on the question, but anyone else? I've personally gone through uh, voc rehab and I did it for education purposes. Um, I've, I've been granted, um, thankfully, uh, to have uh, my master's degree completely paid for. Um, my master's degree is not in business. It's going to be in clinical social work. Um, however, I do know that if you do get to go through the process, that um, if you wanted to to get um, some sort of degree uh, in business that might be able to help you, you know, in the long run, start your own business, um, or you know, that that would definitely be something that I, I could help you with um, as far as linking you to a voc rehab counselor that has worked for me. I have tried it in the past and failed with. Uh, probably about three different counselors. So it, it for me and my, my experience, it's really on the counselor and how you portray how you want to use those benefits. Um, but as far as some, you know, using it specifically for starting your own business and entrepreneurship, I don't necessarily have um, any resources or experience with that. Yeah, Sarah, my experience was is very much like yours. Uh, I was uh, medically retired from the Marine Corps and. Uh, had had the good fortune of uh, advice from uh, one of my undergraduate professors who told me uh, because the disease I had could have uh, could have you know been seriously disabling. Um, he said, "If you have a master's degree, you can always teach," and uh, that was the pitch I made. And uh, and the VA did pay for my graduate uh, education as well, which was in a field that I was uh, able, fortunately, after some very serious uh, medical treatments, uh, was able to move forward and use in my journalism career. Uh, so, uh, sorry, we couldn't be more specific, specific, uh, specific, Eric, but the idea of the possibility of business school, getting an MBA or a BBA um, on voc rehab uh, does look like something that, uh, that might be uh, applicable in this field. So let's, let's do a, a round robin on, uh, we, we've, it's been a broad topic, admittedly, uh, dealing with people who have, uh, are dealing with post-traumatic stress and, uh, all those other issues that relate to uh, starting a business. But uh, I think that we have touched on, uh, on a, a pretty wide variety of topics. So let's go around though quickly. And as uh, panelists have been listening, perhaps there's something you've, that, that we've missed or a little gap to fill or a resource that's come to mind that we want to add. So Cassandra, let's go back to you and, and start, uh, and, and uh, you know, something that we've missed or, or passed over or, or is interest uh, worth repeating. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chaz. Um, one thing that I'd like to stress is the importance of mentorship and peer connection. I know it's been touched on in several different of the remarks from the panelists, um, but we all know that we're students of life no matter what age we are. Um, and by giving back to another veteran, you can pave the way for another entrepreneur to help them address some of the challenges that they're facing as veteran business owners. Or you could learn from an expert who has wisdom that they can share um, and, their, and from their learnings and personal experiences. So, uh, you know, I invite all of you to think of it as an opportunity uh, to listen or to be listened to. Uh, and we know that listening and having someone know where you're coming from 
um, and, and having a good understanding of your experience can be extremely beneficial and cathartic. Um, and there are so many great mentoring organizations out there that match veterans uh, to the appropriate mentor or mentee based on your career interests. And so that's another way to, to get that peer support um, and that guidance as you embark on an entrepreneurial path or as you navigate some of the tricky waters that are associated with being a veteran-owned business. Um, some of them are digitally based, so I'd like to call out Veterati. That's a great platform and it has amazing utility nowadays because of COVID-19. Um, again, digital platform. Another is American Corporate so Partners. Spell, well, while we're doing this, Cassandra, yeah. spell it out, please, again. And, <laughs> and extra so points if you use the phonetic alphabet. <laughs> oh, shucks. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not, I should know the Greek alphabet really well. <laughs> I know most of the phonetic alphabet, but I'm not going to attempt it. That's fine. And so, Veterati is uh, V E T E R A T I. Um, and again, digital based platform, uh, veteran run, fantastic organization. Whoa. Um, and then American Corporate Partners, they're called ACP. They offer a small business uh, development support program. Um, they're an organization that has very, very deep relationships with a number of different corporations out there. And it's been mentioned a few times before that there are corporations that have these set asides, much like the government, for veteran contracting. So the relationships that you can build through a mentor are hugely immense. Um, and through other mentor mentee partners um, in the program as well. So again, that that is another great resource. And then another that comes to mind is uh, an organization called Stand Beside Them. Um, they're based in New York City, but they have uh, national reach. They really focus on coaching, and they they have a great matching uh, program. Um, it's really sophisticated. They they really provide individualized support. Um, in many instances. Folks can be connected to a non-veteran, or you can request to be connected to a veteran mentor. But um, again, I, I think it's really important for us all to understand the value of a very strong network um, and, and extensive relationships, because what you don't know might be knowledge held by somebody else, or someone may have a connection to someone else who knows someone at Amazon. You know, and it's it's kind of like you know when you think about LinkedIn, you've got second and third connections. Um, so the more you build your network, the more vast your reach is going to be, and uh, the more your business has opportunity and exposure to people that can help you get to the next level, provide you with advice, or again, give you that right contact that just might push you in the, the right direction that you want to be headed again. Great. Excellent. Okay. Uh, let's see. How about uh, Kyle and Amanda head back uh, to you all and... Uh, Gaps that we have uh, left uh, unfilled or uh, final thoughts? Uh, so just kind of adding to what Matt and Cassandra were talking about, uh, you know, reaching out to veteran businesses for mentorship opportunities, learning opportunities. Um, one of the things that we do unofficially is uh, mentoring. So we've worked with several veterans and active duty personnel who have contacted us saying, you know, hey, thinking about starting a food truck. I have no idea what I'm doing would you guys be able to help me with this? And so we do, we take the time and we have people come on our trucks, see our operations. I will have um, conversations about business development, what that looks like, um, how to you know, get community outreach programs going. And so I think not being afraid to reach out to a business, you know, whether it be through a you know, program like Cassandra was talking about, what Matt was talking about, or even just directly calling or emailing um, that business to ask for opportunities um, to learn. Yeah, a, a friend of mine um, was for, for a time was in uh, specifically in the, the line of helping veterans figure out what they were going to do next, said veterans often underestimate um, how willing so many people will be to share ideas for free. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Amanda, has that been your experience as well? Obviously, you're sharing with others, but as you've sought out particular advice, have you found that? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, we actually, in some of our interviews even, um, we were interviewed very kind of in the middle of our, our years um, by G.I. Jobs and um, Metropreneur Magazine. And, um, you know, just even having those uh, interviewees or interviewers discuss with us 
some of the resources that um, you know they've been able to attain and offering those services to us. Um, you know, we have worked over the last few months with uh, Veterans History Project and um, Karen and Andrew, you know, have also been very helpful and resourceful for us in that aspect. So I think, um, you know, understanding that asking, is, there's nothing wrong with asking for help, asking for information, you're always going to be able to learn something. Right. And people are willing, more willing, I think, than many uh, veterans realize, respecting uh, that the service that uh, that people Absolutely. have given, which actually gives veterans a, a, a leg up. Kyle, is there is there someone you can think of that you reached out to um, just cold? Yeah, so um, there's a local barbecue restaurant around here. Um, he's a Marine Corps vet. And uh, honestly, he he helped shape our business, I mean, dramatically. He free information, like literally we asked. <clears throat> him. He took the time to explain it because I had no idea what I was doing, like none at all. And he he guided me, he helped me. And uh, I mean, I thank our success very much so for him. So. Yeah, goes to Cassandra's point. Uh, it's often, often it comes down to people helping uh, people, right? So especially another veteran, man, they're always willing to help. They really are. We, we're a tight knit group and everyone shared that same struggle and uh, we, we just want to help. That's, that's a very encouraging. So Sarah, uh, points that we've left out or uh, or resources that, that you want to recommend or final thoughts? Absolutely. Um, I'd, I'd like to add some resources, but quickly, I just wanted to uh, address um, what Matthew had said earlier um, about some veterans might not want to divulge, you know, a disability in order to get, um, you know, startup capital. And, um, you know, I, I would I would encourage them to to please explore, um, you know, have no shame. Um, but there are also several grants and opportunities out there for veterans um, that are minorities, um, veterans of color, um, you know, religion, sexual orientation, um, as well as disability. And to really search for those, you know, grants that are out there specifically to help women as well. Um, so really just kind of look at, you know, at yourself and see what can I use to, to leverage getting some startup capital. Um, you know, in order to start my business. Um, but some of the resources I wanted to share that we didn't um, necessarily mention was um, Bunker Labs. Um, they are, they've been incredibly helpful for us, um, especially they have a specific program called Veterans in Residence. And that provides mentorship and co-working space for a small cohort a couple times a year um, for, for veterans to come together that have different businesses and work together in a space in order to network and facilitate um, ideas and then also receive mentorship. And so that's that's also a really good resource. Um, and then there, there's a lot of- so if you can, uh, Because I, you know, hearing yeah. loss over, over military service, longer yeah. labs you say, or can you spell that? Bunker. Bunker, Bunker labs. labs, got it, okay, yes. Yeah. Um, so Bunker Labs. And there's a lot of other things that we've had as far as, um, pitch competitions that cater to veterans, um, such as Founders Live, Burr Business, and there's, there's a lot that you can search for, but um, that's, that's how we also earn some of our startup capital as well. Um, so I encourage you to participate if you feel like it and you're up for it, um, to, to do some pitch competitions, um, especially if they're geared towards veteran businesses. Um, but one of the absolute biggest um, help for me was um, dog tag bakery and that is a five-month fellowship in the dc area that offers a certificate in business administration they partner with georgetown university and it is specifically for service connected disabled veterans their spouses and caregivers and it's it's five month full-time uh fellowship that focuses on entrepreneurship and also intertwines how to take care of yourself and integrates different wellness practices um, because there are, you know, a lot of veterans that may have um, PTS. And so they really want to, you know, enforce how you can take care of yourself as well as how do I start a business? And that opens up a whole different, um, you know, platform of not, you're leaving the program with a certificate in business administration from Georgetown. You're leaving with wellness practices and a network, and you are leaving with a completed business plan that you have 
pitch to potential investors. Um, the program was absolutely fantastic, phenomenal. I would, I would highly recommend it. Dog Tag Bakery, their five-month fellowship program. Please look it up. Um, I, I do believe maybe with the COVID era, they might, they might start to go completely virtual, which would open it up nationwide. Um, so please check that out. Or if you are in the DC area and they do go back to in-person, it's really helpful because you'll have Georgetown professors come into the bakery where you learn. And then after you get done learning uh, a business you know, class, then you can apply it to the bakery. They, they advertise it as a living business school. And so if you are completely, you have no idea how to start a business, learning from the Georgetown professors that come in and teach you financial, um, you know, accounting, marketing, all these things, and then you are paired with people that work in the bakery and you're immediately able to take those lessons and learn from people that are in those different departments. And, and so it's just incredibly helpful and I would highly recommend checking out Dog Tag Bakery. Excellent, okay. Um, and just briefly to go back, you talked about grants, looking for grants. Other than you know, going to a search engine and type in, you know, how can I get a grant for my business? Are there, are there some aggregators that, have, uh, you know, that allow you to sort of streamline that process? Uh, networking, honestly. Um, again, you know, that's, it's so huge on who you know, and, and by participating in all these resources, um, along with uh, the IVMF that we had mentioned as well, um, are, are the ones that are really helping you um, to point you in the right direction and link you up with the individuals that may be able to help you. Um, but, I mean, most of the time, if you, if you do Google, um, you know, sort of like a very specific you know, maybe a veteran of color, um, you know, might might pop up more. Um, but that's that's what I have to add to that. Sure. So putting yourself out there, obviously, is a recurring theme that we're uh, we're hearing this, uh, and and probably to people who are going to be receptive and helping. So right. So, and, uh, and, and to leverage any site, any kind of you know, identif anything that you identify with that you know, might be considered a minority um, is is something that I really think that you should be proud of and and to to leverage it in addition to veteran status. Great. Matthew, uh, concluding thoughts. Uh, again, a broad conversation and uh, an organiz your organization involved in, in a lot of these aspects. What have we left out or need to uh, be reminded of? Uh, first of all, I want to thank Sarah for bringing up uh, the Bunker Labs. That's a great um, organization that does help folks get started up specifically with uh, in the tech industry and things. And um, I. Also want to thank you for bringing up the Dog Tag Bakery. I'd never even heard of that program. So anytime there's something like that that's really excellent that we want to let people know about, uh, especially if it's something that could be replicated, but if there's ways that people can apply for that or learn more about that, we'd love to be able to share that information. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, if there's a silver lining to what's happening with this COVID situation in the country, there's been a, a large uh, uptick in information about getting grant funding. Um, I will caution veterans about this. If there's Looking for grant funding, just send us a message at novova.org and we'll steer you in a better direction. The first 50 things that should come up in your Google search are gonna be people asking you for money, not giving you money. And the idea that there's a tree of free magic money out there for veterans to start businesses has, has largely been a myth. So please just message us and we'll steer you in a much better direction with places where you can actually apply for funding. And there's no guarantees with that. Like I said, it's difficult to do, but we can help in a, in a, get you in a much more streamlined search than Google's gonna do. Um, but we have seen a lot of companies that want to give out money now, and they have so specifically come to Novova, and so they want us to come up with the, the framework to where they can actually have veterans apply to get grant funding. Um, I know Lowe's companies is one of the companies that just issued uh, $50 million worth of grants that they're gonna give out to diverse businesses, and of course, veterans are part of that. And so that's on Novova's website and on our Facebook page and how you can apply for that funding that's there. Uh, there has been a significant uptick, and one of the nice things about veterans being part of this, this diverse business community, generally speaking, is any of this investment that's gonna happen for diversity and inclusion across the board of which supplier diversity is a part, the veteran business community is going to benefit. So there's going to be more funding that's out there that wouldn't have been there otherwise. And so a um, couple other resources that are worth mentioning, Wells Fargo Works, that's uh, a website that's a free business development tool built by Wells Fargo. 
you don't have to be a Wells Fargo customer. You don't have to apply for a loan through Wells Fargo and Wells Fargo did not pay me to mention this, by the way, this is something that is totally free to anybody in this incredibly sophisticated business. Uh, it's a business plan development tool. And so they've invested heavily in this. Obviously they want to see people use the tool and then come to probably, uh, but it makes people much more prepared when they say, I want to get a business loan. Well, how are we going to recoup the money that we lend to you? That's what any financier needs to know. And this is a tool that really helps you position yourself to be able to say, here's why this idea that I have is going to manifest itself into a profitable enterprise. And I'll be able to not only pay this loan back, pay the interest and everything else and turn a profit with it. It's a very good tool and it's free for vets. Um, we did a program with our, it started in 2009. There were 12 states in the country that had any type of program for veterans. Um, we've got that up to over 35 now, so it's at novova.org slash state tracker. That's Sierra, Tango, Alpha, Tango, Echo, <laughs> Tango, Romeo, Alpha, Charlie, Kilo, Echo, Romeo, state tracker, all one word. And that's where you can get a map that has all of the different programs around the country that have some type of state level program, whether it's buying business or buying from veteran owned businesses, set aside programs to mirror the federal government. Some states even have it where it's a tiebreaker. If you're a veteran and your competitor is a non veteran owned company, you get a 5% um, price preference. So you can actually be 5% higher than your competitor and still be considered low bidder. So it's all across the board of what different states offer different programs. There's 35 of them that we're aware of. So if you're considering uh, government contracting, don't forget about your states and also your local governments. I, I testified in Pittsburgh to get the city of Pittsburgh to do a 5% set aside for uh, veteran owned businesses and city contracting. So federal government's not the only way to go if you're doing that. Obviously, Novova is more um, well, exclusively focused in the private sector, so we really want to see people take advantage of getting certified. And uh, when you're talking about building those relationships and networking with people, every corporation that has a supplier diversity program, the person that manages that program, their job is to act as your concierge internally within that organization to understand your business, find out where there's opportunities, and to help connect you with the decision makers that actually buy things within those corporations. And so, um, I think Sarah had mentioned Johnson and Johnson earlier as one of the companies that's part of uh, the Institute for Veteran Military Families Network. They're also an above a corporate ally and they have 70,000 vendors for that one corporation. So corporations buy an awful lot of stuff and they don't necessarily have employees in house to do that. So find who, are, who is in charge of these corporations in terms of their uh, supplier diversity program and build a relationship with them. And then the final thought that I would leave you with is buy from veterans when we can. If we know that, I know even, um, Sarah, or I'm sorry, with the, the vet chef, you have vendors. Everybody has vendors. We all buy things from people. And when we can, especially as veterans, let's try to buy from other veteran-owned businesses and buy from veteran-friendly organizations. Veteran households spend 16% more on average than uh, non-veteran households, which is an interesting statistic by itself. But also the total spending power of the entire veterans community is in excess of $1.5 trillion annually. So we have considerable... Um, weight to throw around if we decide we're going to spend money with people who are better known or supportive of better known companies, especially corporations, et cetera. So buy from vets when you can and buy from better and friendly companies and make sure that um, we're buying from vets. So thank you. That's supporting vets. Well, I, I tell you, when we started this, it was an ambitious, ambitiously uh, broad topic. And I think that we've done a very good job of uh, certainly not in a deep, comprehensive way, but addressing each of the various issues that come into play and giving people starting points from which to jump off to uh, do greater exploration. So Matthew Pavlik, thanks so much, Matthew. Amanda Gorley, Kyle Gorley with uh, The Vet Chef, Sarah Lezake and uh, Cassandra Alvarez and, and Greg Williams of the uh, New York City uh, Department of Veterans Services. It's wonderful to meet you in this, uh, in this venue. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time to share it. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you everyone. Thank you very much, everybody. So uh, this is going to be uh, a recording of this uh, conversation. It will be posted uh, in a couple of weeks on the uh, Library of Congress webcasts page. So uh, give it a couple of weeks. You'll be able to find it if you care to share the link uh, with other people that you think might find it useful. Uh, again, thanks so much for the, uh, to the uh, Veterans uh, History Project of the Library of Congress for organizing this. Um, you can learn more about them and the work they do in documenting veteran stories by going to LOC, Lima Oscar Charlie dot gov. Uh, you can send them email uh, if you have comments about uh, this conversation or other veterans history issues at VOHP, Victor Oscar Hotel Papa at 
loc.gov, the OHP at loc.gov. Uh, it's been a privilege to be a part of this. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we'll look forward to the next occasion when we can uh, discuss other issues uh, of importance to veterans in the U.S. Again, thanks to the Library of Congress for the venue. Thank you. Thank you all.